Shalom family, welcome to Into All Truth. May the Most High bless the hearers and create a willing spirit to receive the truth from this word, that it might bring forth fruit in righteousness and salvation in Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. So the Most High revealed to me last night that, I mean, I get the this life of mine is an adventure. It's so exciting. Anyway, so this message that I got was that Canada was Canaan. Canaan, da. And of course, you know, I've already looked into America being the land of the Amorites. In one of my other videos, I just touched on it. So in your mind, I'm going to ask you to erase the border between Canada and the United States. It has been the daughter of the beast um, the Queen of England and uh, Europe for the last while really serving them. And you know, this is the whole dynamic of Esau and the Amorites and the Canaanites is that they have this two-headed eagle and that's what Canada and the United States is. When there's a liberal here, there's a conservative in America. And when there's a liberal in America, there's a conservative here. And that's the game. It's really one country. And so biblically, we should all just call it Babylon. So the promise given to Abraham, when around the time he makes his that Yah makes his covenant with him, he Yah says to him, "Know for a surety that your descendants shall be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge. And afterwards shall come they come out with great possessions." And you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come here again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet been fulfilled. So here is a reference to the Amorites. And in the word, what has happened before will happen again. So now I want you guys to remember that Canada and the United States were one country, one nation until 1776. So anything that happened before in America happened in Canada. It was one nation and it never really changed. So hold on to that thought. Do remember slavery in America was slavery in Canada because it was all one nation. Okay, so again, it was Babylon. It wasn't Canada and the United States or North America. It was Babylon and slavery started in Babylon in um, 1619. Now, the reason why I am saying that we should blur this line is because what Canada does is hides its slavery history behind this false notion that the first slave came here in 1629. A young boy from Madagascar, New Guinea arrived and uh, he was sold and his name was Lejeune, and he was uh, this man named Colliard's domestic. When in fact, it was all one nation when that happened, when the first slaves came into America itself, North America. So, and there's Canadian history that is lost to Americans and belongs to, you know, Hebrew Americans because it connects the journeys that all of the family took, the diaspora. Uh, through the slave trade, through um, Babylon into Europe, uh, the triangular slave trade, back to Africa, and all of that sort of thing. So this is how you connect the dots, and we have to see the, the beast as a whole. You guys are living in the body, we're living in the head up here. So we put the head together with the body, and we can begin to deal with it. So North America was called Canada and Azareth which again means another land, the final place, the end, vanishing point, time out of mind, last end, posterity, hintermost reward. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Babylon was the first global empire, worldly empire to rule the world and Babylon will be the last global worldly empire to rule the world. What you might not know about Canada is Canada still swears an oath to the Queen. We're not really truly independent of the British monarchy, okay, the British Kingdom. We're part of the Commonwealth. And so here's some pointers, some indicators of that. 
So these are basically the degrees of freedoms that we have. In 1977, Canadian Citizen Act is revised. Canadian citizenship becomes the only legal form of citizenship in Canada. In 1977, the Governor General assumes nearly all diplomatic duties from the Queen. In 1990, O Canada officially replaces God Save the Queen and is adopted as a national anthem. In 1982, the Constitution Act is revised. The British Parliament can no longer amend Canada's Constitution. So that's supposed to be the moment of freedom. In 1988, authority is established granting Canadians the right to have their own coat of arms. And that also means we have our own army, our own military. In 1999, the phrase that I will uphold my duties as a Canadian citizen and obey the laws of Canada is added to the Canadian oath of citizenship as alongside the oath to the queen. So we still swear allegiance and an oath to the queen. And then in 2004, all letters of credence from foreign ambassadors are now formally addressed to the Governor General of Canada and not the Queen. So as you can see, Canada is operating as the head of the Illuminati beast in the UK. So if you look at Canada and America put together, we are the beast. We have a little woman riding the beast on top of Canada, and we are Babylon. So you need to call us Babylon. Bob Marley was right in calling it Babylon. So to start, here's a basic map of how all the lands were allotted to the three brothers, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, when they washed up on the new earth. But I think that the land of Shem might have extended to India, but that's another video. So we know that Israel was only in Egypt for about 215 years, including the reign of Joseph. Joseph, Jacob, and his sons sojourned in Egypt, but they were not oppressed until everyone forgot Joseph. And so the guess is that Joseph's rule was about 70 years, and then beyond that was the amount of time that they were there, guessing to be maybe 80 to 100 and some years max. So the word says, know for a surety that your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. But in the fourth generation, they shall come here again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. I've written here twice. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet been fulfilled. And that's what this video is about, is the iniquity of the Amorites. Because America is full of Amorites. America is amorite -ka. And keep in mind, Abraham was in Canaan and Egypt for 430 years, his, whole, his family and his lineage. And then Joseph was forgotten by the Egyptians. Um, but the Egyptians were not Canaanites. The Egyptians were Cushites. Okay, Canaanites are different from Cushites. I've already shown you the genealogy. So the confusion comes in when we look at Exodus 12, 40 says, the Israelites lived in Egypt for a total of 430 years to the day when Moses led them out. But other manuscripts like the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint say, and Canaan. So it says the length of the time the Israelites the people lived in Egypt and Canaan was 430 years. But then in Galatians, in Galatians 3, 16 to 17, Paul makes reference to a 430 year period from the time that Abraham received the promise from Yah to the time when Moses actually received the law. So that was the 430 year bracket. So in Acts 7, 6, it says, and God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land 
and they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage, I will judge, saith Yah. And after that, they shall come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. So Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob and Jacob begat the 12 patriarchs. But you know what? Egypt was not a strange land. And this scripture doesn't confirm that this isn't going to happen again. Because Abraham lived in Egypt under Abimelech, who he sort of gave Sarah to, pretending he was she was his sister. And also the word says that Israel will go into Egypt again in Deuteronomy, which is after they've come out of Egypt. It says, and the Lord will return you to Egypt in ships by a route that I said you should never see again. There you will sell yourselves to your enemies as male and female slaves, but no one will redeem you. Okay, so this is after the Egyptian in Exodus. So we know Israel is going to go into Egypt again by ships. And there's no account of it already happening and it being a big deal. So um, America is clearly a type of Egypt. It's, it's a type of Babylon. So Jeremiah 23 says, So behold, the days are coming, declares Yah, when they will no longer say, as surely as the Most High lives, who brought the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. Instead, they will say, as surely as Yah lives, who brought and led the descendants of the house of Israel from the land of the north and from all other countries to which I had banished them. They will dwell once more in their own land. So that has not happened. We all know this, people. But if you look at Israel, that has not happened in Israel. People have not come from all four corners of the earth as a great multitude to dwell in a city without walls. The name Canada comes from the Huron Iroquois word Kanatan. It was in the Western lands where people like Queen Khalifa settled, where it was called Arzareth which is referred to in the Bible. The 10 tribes are mentioned again, as I've said before, in 2nd Ezra 1340, and hence this land is called Azareth. It was where no man dwelt, and it took in a year and a half for them to get here. And uh, this does not necessarily exclude Australia or South Africa. As I believe that they went to those places as well. It's quite clear. It's the Israelite descendants are the African looking people here in North America, the indigenous people. So Hope of Israel, a, a sort of pro-Zionist site puts forward the notion that Canaanites are the more sort of Mongol looking descendants with the aquiline noses, um, the sort of rockier foreheads, stonier foreheads. And they identify them as you know, being people with totem poles that uh, of the Canaanites that they had to that had to be smashed when the Europeans came here. But more research articles show that um, when the he when they first came here to meet the Indians, they were very much like the Hebrews. They used the name Yah. They um, didn't worship pagan gods. They circumcised. They passed pa practiced annual feasts and festivals. So I'm just not so sure that it might be a totally different people. It's entirely possible that it might just be the difference between the 12 sons of Jacob versus the two sons of Joseph. Who knows? I'm still in, up in the air about this. But I recently went to a powwow and I saw so many of the indications of the Hebrew Israelites. They call their grandfather Selah, which is Hebrew for stop, look and listen. They were wearing tassels. All of their tribes have a lamed, a staff. They wear headbands. They wear diadems on their forehead. Uh, they say, hey, Yah, when they're praising Yah. And it says that they worship the storm god here. But of course, the Lord will come like a whirlwind to destroy the oppressors against Israel. So I'm still up in the air about that. As for the European Amorites and Canaanites, though, that's a different thing. Hebrews tend to have smoother and rounder foreheads. So that's definitely a difference 
So, and California is named after Queen California. The Spaniards had commissioned a book in the 1500s called Queen Khalifa, and they say that Queen Khalifa is a pagan who's convinced to raise an army of women warriors from California to with a large flock of trained griffins so that she can join a Muslim battle against Christians defending Constantinople and then she becomes a Christian. This is much the same way that a Hollywood movie would make up a movie to rewrite our history, you know, at the time. But um, she was very obviously a Israelite who was likely then force converted to Christianity and then said to be a Muslim to fit with that whole paradigm because we know that Christianity or Catholicism and the Muslim faith and the cabal and uh, the are all sort of mixed together as one religion and it's not the true Hebrew religion. So this was a, a rewriting of the history of the indigenous people who were there. When Spain got possession of the New World, the Moranos attempted to find a refuge from the Inquisition in both the East and West Indies and also in the New World. And so uh, there were translators, Morano translators, who came to the New World and were able to communicate with their lost relatives in the West Indies and in the New World. So the first, quote, hired Israelite on North American soil was Matthew de Costa, who spoke French, Dutch, and Portuguese. The Basques of northern Spain were frequent visitors to um, the fisheries in the Atlantic coast. Well, now, of course, we know that he was a Hebrew and he would be speaking Hebrew, so he'd be able to communicate with the indigenous people of this land. So he was brought into in through the Atlantic, through what is now Eastern Canada, but was really one nation. And of course, Canadians are like, it's a mystery how Co Costa knew how to be an interpreter with the First Nations of America. In this reference on the Canadian history page, it says that he would have learned these European languages from European explorers going to Africa. However, we know the Moors went up into Northern Europe. And you'll see a reference to Holland here and Holland kidnapping um, da Costa. But in truth, the Moors sought refuge in, in um, places like Holland and the UK with the rise of Spain. And that's how those nations were able to rise because then they transferred their wealth and knowledge and all of their connections up into Northern Europe. I'm going to go into a quick history of Canada at the end of this video. But this just points to the connection between the Moors who were coming over from Spain and then who also helped Columbus come here and the uh, Africans who gave all the rumors of the uh, tra trade winds and um, the oceanic tides and streams that could bring ships over here. So that's how people were able to come here. And I also want to note that when you look at Canada, it is literally noted as being in the here in the Huron Iroquois area. And so this is where the French settled. And of course, the French are very much mixed in with the Ashkenazi Jews. And it was in eastern Canada that Canada was called Kanata. Now, according to Egyptologists and Assyriologists and Sumerologists, there are records from ancient times about the existence of nomadic people known as the Amorites, Amuru or Akkadian. Akkadian is part of the name Canadian. So you see they would be up in Canada physically. They were known to be a fair-skinned people, blue eyes, aquiline nose, straight nose, thin lips, and fair hair, which is the description of the Europeans. Which I suspect was the French or the Canaanites who moved north, north, northwards, up, northeastwards, up through Asia. And you see the O negative blood type is very concentrated in Canada, in Eastern Brazil and Australia, but very much more in Canada than even in the United States. So everyone wonders where the Canaanites got to after being driven out by the Israelites. Well, many remained, um, but also a lot of them went to North America. Uh, so the Canaanites are the descendants of Sino, one of the sons of Canaan. 
who bred with the Horites and other people whose lineage is really not accounted for post floods. So they are kind of descended from giants. So again, you see the Canaanites among the Asians and among the um, French Canadians today in Canada. Uh, but let's talk about the origins of the word Ammonite or Amorite and Amerimnos, Amerimnos. We find Amerinos can mean free from care or anxiety or free from care or without carefulness, without carefulness or free from concern. The NAS says trouble. Now it's interesting that uh, the person who discovered quote the Americas after of course everyone else did <laughs> His name was Amerigo Vespucci, so-called Amerigo Vespucci. And so America was named after him. And if we look at the word Amerigo and we look at America and we look at Amorite, they all have seven letters. So I want to go uh, it into a little bit into the lineage of the Amorite. So now some of the descriptives of the Am Amorites is that among their distinguishing features are fair skin, blue eyes, light skin, and light hair, aquiline noses. And they are also the last remnants of the giants. And they tended to live in caves, wore animal skin clothing, and ate raw flesh. They even invaded ancient Egypt, where they began their uh, religion of worshipping Hasetan. Now, the Amorites were known to have migrated to Western Europe, into the Caucasus areas. And they had actually enslaved the Canaanites in the past, even though they were in part Canaanites. And um, the Babylonians, who were the Amorites, are really now the British, the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and the German. And they are, and associated peoples. And uh, the Babylonians are now the Americans, the ancient Amorites. Amorites were known to worship Satan and their religions include Christianity, Islam, Judaism, and Hinduism, which are all inherently satanic. Now, it's also thought that ancient Egypt consisted of two regions, Upper and Lower Egypt. And so the same is true of the activities of the Amorites in North America, which divided the United States and Canada in the same fashion, north to south. So the Amorites are descendants of Canaan, and uh, there's the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Hittites, there's so many of them. But the Amorites, um, and obviously the Canaanites, right, because they're all from Canaan, and Canaan was supposed to be the offspring of Ham after he uncovered his father's nakedness, in other words, his own mother's nakedness. Now, what you may not know is that Esau dwelt among the Canaanites and married a Canaanite as well. So here's the generations of Esau, who is Edom. That's Esau, who Jacob stole the blessing from. And he took of the daughters of Canaan a wife. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and Ahilama, the daughter of Anna, and Zibion, and daughter of Zivian the Hibite. And these are the dukes and sons of Esau. And we get finally down to the Duke Amalek. And Amalek was related to the Amorites. So there is a genetic connection. Because Esau spoiled his seed. He mixed in amongst the people who were mixed in with angel blood. So there's nothing wrong with mixing with Japheth or with Ham. The problem is mixing with the stranger fallen seed. Not only that, but Esau dwelt in Mount Seir where the Horites came from. And they were another family that didn't really have, isn't listed as having a genealogy in the Bible at all. So we're not sure where they come from. Now I'm saying all this stuff not to 
totally demonize these people. Yah has come to save the entire world. So it's whoever shall, you know, receive Yeshua, Mashiach, and um, clings to Israel. But this is just tracking who these people are so we can understand what was done to us. These are also things that we did to ourselves by cursing ourselves as Israel. And then, of course, I'm mixed. So I'm mixed in with Japheth, who also practiced this. But here is the curse against uh, Esau because he abandoned Israel in her time of need. He says, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir and prophesy against it and say to it, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee and I will stretch out my hand against thee and I will make thee most def desolate. I will lay thy cities waste and thou shalt be desolate and thou shalt know I am Yerveh. I will make thee a perpetual desolation and thy city shall not return and you shall know that I am the Lord. You know, the promise is quite clear. The desolate condition of the Edomite nation to be perpetual, its cities would never exist again, not at its old site and not at a new location. And so um, you see here this wandering Jew portrayed uh, in this drama called The Eternal Jew in the Hebrew Theater in 1922. And uh, this is said to be the cursed Edomites who are prone to wander without hope or rest. But I don't believe that's the case for Esau ultimately. If he clings to Israel and just like um, Job did, he his whole family was destroyed and Yet he clung to Yah, and Yah gave him a whole new family, because we are not to despise our brothers, but the people who cling to their name, and Hahasetan, the prince of um, Mount Seir, will fall. And you say, see it says Mount, uh, Mount Seir, it mentions Mount Seir, and that was when Edom married himself to Hasetan and the fallen ones. Now, the only word of the Amorite language that is supposed to have survived is Shinar, the name they gave to Mount Hermon, Shinar. So then when you look at Ezekiel 5.1, it talks about the woman in the basket who is lifted up and set upon her base. So the basket flies east. Now, if it flies east, it's flying west to America. And so here are some other signs that we have um, of shiner. And that is that when you get punched in the eye, they call it a shiner. And look at all these celebrities and Illuminati sporting the shiner, the black eye. So um, America is clearly a type of Egypt. It's, it's a type of Babylon. And Babylon is where the Amorites dwelt. It's located between the Tigris River and the Euphrates. And it is known here, you see, to be the country of two great rivers. The country of two great rivers. And America has two great rivers also. And both um, sets of rivers split. So it's a country of two great rivers. You see where the rivers split. So the Euphrates and the Tigris, and then America has two great rivers that split also, the Ohio and the Missouri, which are split up at the top and then funnel down into the Mississippi. And so this is the prophecy concerning Babylon and the creation of the final Babylon. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. So we skip down to verse 3. Then he said unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off on, as on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house, and it shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. So, and then the last scripture, and he said unto me to build it an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. So this is the new Babylon that is being prophesied through Zechariah. 
And it's interesting because the word thief is um, Strong's Concordance Hebrew word H1590. And it's the same one applied to the law of Deuteronomy around man stealing. This is the scripture. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel and maketh merchandise of him or sells him, then, he, then that thief shall die and you shall put evil away from among you. So this is, so according to the law, a Christian is a brother to the Hebrew Israelites adopted into the family of faith, right? And Esau is also a brother of the Israelites. So I think they might be subject to this law. And when we look at the prophecy over Babylon, we see that that is true. The other aspect of this is swearing falsely by Yah's name. And I think this is misusing his name or the identity of the children of Israel. So once again, uh, as in 1 Corinthians and Matthew, a marinos means secure without carefulness. It's also used for trouble. So a marinos. And so you see they had three words there because they kind of don't really want you to know what it means. But these are people of trouble. So Isaiah 47, 8 says, You said I will be queen forever. You did not take these things to heart or consider their outcome. So now hear this, O lover of luxury, who sits securely, who says to herself, I am and there is none beside me. I will never be a widow or know the loss of children. These two things will overtake you in a moment, in a single day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come upon you in full measure in spite of your many sorceries and spells. Therefore, now there art given to pleasures and that dwellest carelessly. So these are the careless people. And thou sayest in thy heart, I am and none else. So she's vaunted herself up as a god, the Canaanites and the Amorites. Again, Genesis 15 speaks of the captivity of Israel and then man mentions the Amorites' iniquity. Know for a surety your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and they shall afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions and you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come here again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Of course, in Deuteronomy, it is mentioned that it does happen again. And it says further down again that these nations shall be given into the hand of Abraham's children, the Canaanites, Canaanites, Amorites, etc. And here we see also once again that the people that is, sorry, the people that Israel will be fighting against and driving out and that Yah will drive out will be the Canaanites, the Amorites. These are all the people who come against Yah's true children. Revelation 18 says, give back to her as she has done to others. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion of her own cup. As much as she has glorified herself and lived in luxury, give her the same measure of torment and grief. In her heart, she says, I sit as a queen. I am not a widow and will never see grief. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day, death and misery and famine. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. And then, then alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. So we see the red, white, and blue. So in terms of the history of blacks in Canada, just here's a brief rundown. So I've already mentioned to you that the first Hebrew Israelites in America were the 10 tribes and the land was given to them by Yah. And then next, um, the slaves that were brought here from West Africa to, the, to North America. So the ones who arrived, as they say, which is also inaccurate, in 1619. And then the first northern slave was the one they mentioned, Lejeune. But the first slaves here were actually the 10 tribes, and they were sold in the triangular slave trade. Uh, the first slave in 
New France in uh, basically Quebec, arrived with the Kirk brothers in 1629. His name was Oliver June. In 1776, there were many black loyalists in Nova Scotia after the American Revolution, as many as 10,000 escaped slaves went there. And those who fought for Britain were given freedom and sent there and also to British Columbia. And then in 1776, Marie Joseph Angelique was tortured and hanged in Montreal for burning Montreal. There was no evidence that she did that. She was sort of scapegoated for it. And it was also just a little bit before there were riots in um, Shelburne, uh, Nova Scotia. The first race riot in no North America was in Shelburne, Nova Scotia. And you have to remember, Nova Scotia was one of the main settling lands for Americans, for all people in North America. The riots began because the blacks were working for lower wages than the whites and there was a Baptist minister who was quite harmless and he was he began baptizing both whites and blacks. So the whites ran in and took some hooks and tackle out and put them in his, attached them to his home and pulled his whole house down and that's what started the race riot. The black loyalists did an exodus Many of them went to Sierra Leone. Some of them went to other parts of Canada in about 1791. In 1793, the anti-slavery bill was introduced. It didn't ban slavery, but marked its prohibition. In 1796, the Maroons landed. They came from Jamaica, from the Spanish, and um, and as we know that they were called Maroons because Maroons, Mores, were teachers of Levitical laws. Mores were black people. And um, so they were sent from Trelawney to Halifax and worked on building the Citadel Fort in the harbor. And they were supposed to guard the fort in Nova Scotia. But um, there was a there was conflict between the local um, African Americans and the the Maroons, and so these Maroons also then went off to Sierra, Sierra Leone in the 1800s. It's 1815 to 1860, the rail, Underground Railroad went through Canada, went up into Nova Scotia, uh, went into Toronto, and so forth. And then there was also in 1819, there was a settlement of blacks in Ontario. And that was also because uh, these uh, black loyalist refugees had helped in the War of 1812. In 1833, British Parliament abolished slavery, but it was... Um, finally achieved because, um, it, you know, Canada was part of the British Commonwealth. In about 1853, Provincial Freemans, uh, a newspaper was established by Mary Ann Shad in Windsor, Ontario, to protect and keep track of the issues that refugees from the United States had. And it also supported women's rights. And in 1902, the Women's Club was founded. Of course, they were, had been kicked out of the European Women's Clubs. And so they set up their own club. But hey, we all know now that segregation is good because we are a set-apart people. These women helped to eliminate so social and economic ostracism and helped many Black fam families with difficulty, providing wa warm clothing for newly arrived families from the Caribbean, etc. Now, in 1858... Um, I have to jump back a bit here. There was a Starks family that came from the United States, from California, up into Vancouver, British Columbia. And the Starks family is quite well known in BC. They settled actually on the islands. Between 1905 and 1912, more than a thousand African Americans crossed the border to settle in small communities around Edmonton. Most came from Oklahoma fleeing Jim Crow, which stripped, stripped them of their rights. And they were best known for their farm colonies. And um, they were in Athabasca, Saskatchewan, Gibbons. In Alberta, they faced a terrible winter when they first came. About 40% died off unaided by their British and uh, Ukrainian farmers. You can see stories where they say that everyone was very helpful, but that's not true. I went to a uh, reunion of Shiloh Baptist Church, which was their church. And there was a lot of history um, in my, my best friend, uh, Brenda Mays. Her family 
was among these Oklahoma families, and they talked about the fact that many of that over 40 of percent of them were wiped out in the winter, and nobody helped them. Uh, and then when the depression came, they lost their farms and went into the city and dealt with a lot of um, depression there and I issues of integration. They were able to establish a Shiloh Baptist Church at this time, but they were also facing a well-established Ku Klux Klan in Alberta who are still thriving. So um, in 1946, Viola Desmond sits in an unintegrated theater and inspires integration. In 1947, the Saskatchewan Bill of Rights is passed. So you can see with the depression leading to people coming into the city, there's more, um, there's not as much independence. And so there's a need for laws to manage the hostility of the Europeans towards the Hebrew Israelites. To manage and mitigate the hostility of the Canaanites towards the Israelites. Okay, so uh, in 1960, a terrible thing happened in Nova Scotia called the destruction of Africville, Halifax City Dump. Here's an image of a Halifax City Dump with a sea view, and they poured nuclear waste and all of their dump in this community in Africville, which had no running water, no sewage system, no garbage pickup, no street lights, no public transportation paved roads. Instead, it was basically an open dump, an incinerator, and a, a prison, and it was by the railroad tracks. And so, um, so basically, uh, the government decided, and here's the words, just like in Israel, instead of fixing things, Halifax City officials decided to raise it, raise Africville. By 1967, after several years of study and talk, um, Halifax planned to relocate the 400 citizens of Africville. Now, the same thing happened in Vancouver in an area called Hogan's Alley, where everyone was pushed out so that they could create the Georgia Viaduct. Anyway, back to Halifax, the C Canadian government issued an official apology for the destruction of Africville and pledged 250000 to rebuild the church. And I went down to that church, actually. I have pictures of me and my nephews there, a Seaview African United Baptist Church, which opened on, coincidentally, September 11th. So um, just a quick note here in BC in the 1900s, um, Vancouver was home to Hogan's Alley. Um, it had a lot of black families or Negro families with Southern style restaurants, a black nightclub jazz scene, and the city's only black church. And here is uh, an image from Black Strathcona, remembering a few of the lively characters that uh, animated uh, the stretch just before East Van. And of course, it was demolished in the 1960s to make room for the Georgia Viaduct. Uh, but you can go to this YouTube channel to just watch some of the videos, if you like, on Hogan's Alley. And so here it is. And, and uh, here's Fies for Pies, Chicken and Steakhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Black Strathcona, Leona's Kids. So there's a lot of jazz musicians, etc. You can find out about Barbara Howard, who was one of the first um, Black Canadian athletes to participate. Of course, Jimi Hendrix, uh, his family is here, and much, much more. So go ahead and take a look at that. We jump forwards to spring of 1968. Black Caribbean students at Sir George William University, now part of Concordia University in Montreal, accused biology lecturer of racism. They complained the teacher was handing out failing grades to his black students, regardless of the quality of their work. And there was a student uprising, um, the largest one in Canadian history at Concordia University. Now here's some positive change in the 1970s. Um, my mother became one of the first Negro Hebrew women psychiatrists, the first black woman psychiatrist in Canada. Her great best friend, Rosemary Brown, politic politician, feminist, educator. You see her on this stamp for Canada. She became um, the first black woman elected to can the Canadian provincial legislature, running for leadership for the NDP. Yeah, my dad ran for the NDP. New Democratic... Pro uh, party. 1985 to 1981, Lincoln Alexander was the first 
Negro Hebrew Black Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, 1993, Jean Augustine was the first black woman elected to Parliament in Canada, 2005, Michelle Jean was sworn in as Governor General, and in 2016, Viola Desmond, Negro Hebrew, will be the first ne Negro Hebrew to appear on Canadian currency. You guys, thank you so much for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe. Bless you all. Love you all, brothers and sisters and family. And I really encourage you guys, I may put links down below to more videos, but to research this history because you see how interwoven it is with your history, okay? So, so many African Americans coming up here, Jamaicans going back and forth, people going to Sierra Leone, and a lot of the slave, more slaves were taken. I have to say here at the beginning that more slaves were sold from Canada initially than bought. And these were the, the Hebrew Negroes who were sold in the triangular slave trade into the West Indies and down into Africa. So Shalom family may yeah, bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine on you. Maybe he, he be gracious, lift the light of his countenance and give you peace. Shalom.